Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this session of the Book Lovers Festival. Um, before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge uh, that we, on the lands of the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation, um, and we'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we have a very special guest today, this is Fable Parrot. Hello, Fable. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about Fable as if she's not here um, and look at you. So, uh, before we get on to this session about creativity and writing and process and and honesty and what that actually means. Um, we also do have, Fable's brought in some props, which is going to be wonderful. Um, I'm going to talk about Fable and then um, and then we'll get onto it that way. So here's, if you don't know, uh, Fable's career was launched uh, with her critically acclaimed debut, Past the Shallows, a heartbreaking novel. It was sold internationally, shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award and won the Dobby, the, sorry, the Dobby Literary Award. Fable also won the, um, the Albia Newcomer of the Year Award in 2012. Congratulations. Uh, her next novel, When the Night Comes, was also critically acclaimed and further consolidated her reputation with booksellers and readers. Um, her brand new novel, which is it out yet or has just about to come out? It's out in nine, tw tw two weeks. In two weeks. is called There Was Still Love. But if it is look, for sale here if today. You look behind you, it's... It's on for sale, so you would actually get to have it early. Um, and I was very, very lucky to have an, an early copy of this book a couple of months ago. Um, and I still think about it today. And actually, uh, sometimes when I think about it, I cry. Uh, because, uh, and I will tell you why. Uh, it is um, it's set in Prague and Melbourne um, in 1938 and 1980. 1936. I've read. I totally read the book. <laughs> uh, no, um, and it's a beautifully rendered story of a family separated by the trauma of World War Two and then reunited in 1980. Uh, for me, this novel is about loyalty of working people fighting uh, to give others a good life. Um, it's also about what happens when the world moves on without you, and what it means to love, to show compassion, and to reinvent yourself um, just to survive. Um, I found this book to be uh, deeply moving and very unexpectedly tender. Um, and yeah, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since. And I, um, so with that, I'm going to pass over to Fable because I would like you uh, to talk a little bit about your this book in particular and then we'll take it from there about how you created it. Um, yeah, thanks for coming everyone. Um, so my new book is called uh, There Was Still Love. It is... Um, essentially a, a love letter to my grandparents. I didn't mean to write this novel. I didn't um, intend on writing this novel, but I had a strange experience in a, a little deli that I'd never been to before where I found um, a, a jar of Czechoslovakian gherkins that I hadn't seen since I was a little kid. And um, there were three jars on the shelf and I, I bought them all. They were warm. And I, I went out to my car and I opened uh, one of the jars and um, took a bite of the gherkin and I just started to cry. The sense memory was so strong. Um, and I immediately drove to the Faulkner Cemetery where my grandparents are buried and I sat with them and I just talked to them and it was the first time I'd talked to them since I was about 16, even though they weren't there. But I, um, and I just said, I, I don't know anything about your lives. I, I, I know your lives for the 16 years that I had you on this planet and I don't know anything else. And I'm sorry that I don't know anything else, but I, I want to know and I'd give any anything to like drive to your flat and see you um so i thought it would be a short story about gherkins <laughs> which it started i started writing and it was sort of this piece about gherkins and how my grandparents would save their coins and put them in a gherkin jar and th those coins would turn into airplane tickets that would take them home to prague every three or four years that's how long it would take them to save um, 
but it just kept going. The bits kept coming more and more and more. And so I just had to follow it when you've got that energy coming. The whole time I was writing this book, I was completely convinced it would never be published, which freed me a lot because I was able to just write whatever I wanted. I didn't have this fear of it being published. And luckily for me, uh, my publishers liked it and have made it into a book. Um, but yeah, it's crazy how stories find you. And um, when something like that happens and it's that strong, you really got to follow it, don't put it away, even if it feels hard and raw and makes you cry. <laughs> Um, that is gold to get like that sort of inspiration. It can happen anywhere. I was going to say things, things like that. They really do happen at any time and any moment. And I think uh, one of the good things. So actually, this kind of leads in because uh, Fable and I talk a lot about just process and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the, as you were talking about that, I'm like, it reminds me of a conversation we've had just about how creativity can be like magic. And I kind of use that in in the the bigger sense of the word that, you know, for a lot of people, ideas are just there, out there, and then um, sometimes, and then they come to those who are listening the most and who are paying a lot of attention to them. So I wondered, that's how I kind of see and, it. And, and, I and follow if, through. So you, you can have those ideas and if you don't get concrete them down, that they can go or fly away. Um, following it through even when it feels like, I don't know what this is about. A really good example, and I'll just jump in. My first novel, Past the Shallows, I write completely out of order and it's the way I've done all of my books. I don't know the whole story. In fact, I don't know much of the story. I follow characters' voice and energy and write scenes and then try and put it together at the end or when I've got a lot of work. Past the Shallows, I kept writing about this old Holden, this 1950s Holden with red cherry seats and dreams of the Holden, uh, uh, memories of the Holden, bits of the Holden in the shed. And I had no idea why I was writing. I'm not into cars at all. I, it was really frustrating. I was like, I don't know why I'm writing about this car. It keeps coming up and I thought, I won't throw it away. I'll keep the stuff, but it's not gonna be in the book. It's weird. But it turned out to be the absolute key to understanding the story because it was the mum's car and she'd had an accident in this car. And um, if I'd thrown that away or not written it, I, the novel wouldn't be what it is. So there's some kind of trust that maybe th that you've got to give yourself that your brain knows more than you know. Your unconscious knows a lot more than your conscious does. And if this stuff's coming through, write it down, work on it, even if you're not sure where it will go or if it'll be in the book or the story or the piece. It's, it sounds very much like the way that you write, because, you know, writers write differently and um, we know writers who kind of just, they have like this small idea and then they sit there and they plot everything and then, you know, um, maybe they'll develop that a bit later. Um, but that's how they kind of work. And I think uh, what you're saying uh, resonates with me a lot because that's how I work. Um, and I think the thing that you said, though, was um, just that idea of, yeah, the, the way that your subconscious can uh, pick up on things um, that you're... There's almost this... Uh, it sounds like, for you, at least, there's this other sense of yourself that is uh, knows uh, maybe a particular kind of truth or where something needs to go emotionally that Fable right now hasn't caught up to yet. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about, um, and again, so when a voice, when the voice of a story comes through you or anything like that, um, the thing that makes you keep going for it. And so if you could maybe talk about what it feels like for you or um, what compels you to keep going, because sometimes stories come to us and it might just be, um, a short story or it might be a novel or because we don't know what it is no. so what um so maybe we can go from there and then we can start uh the, you know talking about what ideas are good and what ideas are bad and that kind of stuff there, there, there's there was that first energy with the gherkins and then after that is the harder bit mm -hmm. which is sitting with the work every day this book I worked harder than I 
did with the other two and I so I was very regimented five hours a day two hours on the weekends even if I wasn't writing I had to sit in the room with the work meaning it could just be me looking at black and white photos of Prague and writing some notes or it could be just writing random memories about my grandparents Mm -hmm. or it could be working on a scene but that's when the hard work comes in so there's it's less inspiration and more just you pushing through so it's the um, hardest bit of it it's great when you get those scenes Mm -hmm. just given to you it doesn't always happen you've got to sit there with the work and that can be really uncomfortable some days you want to do anything else you want to run you want to do clean the whole house Mm. which is I hate cleaning rather do that you're just (laughs) sitting in a room feeling like it's impossible it's really hard it's not working you feel yuck yuck it's like um oh like your skin you want to scratch your skin off it's like you just want to get up and run (laughs) um to push through that is we usually when you get the good stuff, if you can sit there in that uncomfortable feeling, even if it makes you really angry, often something really mm-hmm. good can come through after you've sat through that feeling and started to write. Um, and so, yeah, this one was really, I was really quite hard on myself and I became a recluse and I just wanted to be with my grandparents and the work and I didn't go out, I didn't see friends, I was, it was a weird time. Do you think, it sounds like just on that and, and the idea of, because uh, some stories are harder to write than others, and I think I keep coming back to the thing that you said, that, you know, your this was a love letter to your grandparents, and I wonder if, did you feel a sense of duty to them in some way, and if you want to talk about what that might yeah. have been, or do you just think it was more like, oh, this thing has come to me in, in a way that I didn't expect it to and I I want to honour some kind of, I don't know, even if it's like a work ethic because in this book, you know, the grandfather, um, you know, uh, is this working class man who, you know, uh, in his union and or, like just, I just, I know, I keep seeing these little sparks that you're talking about and I just wondered if that was, you know, if you were conscious at the beginning that this is what actually you're writing towards. Yeah, um, it's always – none of my books are um, true mm-hmm. but none of them are completely made up, meaning I'm I'm in all of them. My memories, my feelings, my emotions are in all of them. So they're all difficult because you, you're, you've got this sense of extreme exposure. I found it really – um, useful at the start I wrote myself a letter that said oh, you're allowed to write whatever you want it doesn't you don't have to um, give it to anyone to read it's just yours and that freed me a lot because mm. with families there's other people involved who am I going to upset someone my dad my like uncle my you know even though it's not entirely true yeah. my grandparents are in this the essence of them um And what would they think, knowing them being the way they were, they'd be embarrassed by being in a book. You know, they never told their story to anyone. It was that generation where you didn't talk about yourself, you didn't talk about the past. My brother said to me, I don't want to be in this book because there's bits of my brother in all of my books and he said, you know, I'm sick of being in your books. Even though he's not really, there are some stories of his of and course. bits of him in my books because we're very close. So that was – that threw up a, a, a you know, a curveball because then I was like, oh, okay, this child doesn't have any siblings then. Mm. That's different. So um, I was aware of other people but I tried to let myself be free and just the joy was remembering the great – my grandparents remembering the funny things and the lovely things and being in their flat, which was my whole world when I was little because we spent the um, majority of the week there, weekdays. So it was home. These people were um, – so that was the payoff for me, yeah. these bits of memory, in the, you know, of my granddad, my grandma. Um, 
The other thing that happened with this book, which was really lucky, my cousin lives in Prague. He grew up in communist Prague. And um, we haven't spoken for, for 25 years. I got in touch with him and said, look, Martin, I'm going to need some help because I can't write what it's like to be a child in communist Prague. I need it to be co really real, really correct. And he was really excited and he was working as a driver for a film studio. So he had a lot of time waiting around in the car. So I just get these messages on Messenger, Fave, mm. ask me a question. <laughs> and like nothing was enough. He's like, another one, another one, another one. And he was loving remembering because he grew up with his grandma, which was my grandma's sister. Yeah. But he was in communist Prague and we were in Melbourne and they were, are twins. So it's, you know, we had the same grandma but totally different places. Um, and some of his stories sort of morphed themselves. They were such great stories that are, they're in the novel. So when I finished the novel, the first person to read it was Martin, my cousin in Prague. And I was waiting, waiting, waiting for the okay or, you know, I was worried I'd upset him. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, it, it's pretty – some of his life has been pretty sad. And um, I got this message and it just said, have you had a head injury? Question mark. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, he's – He's really upset. And then the next line was, Czech people do not eat potato dumplings with schnitzels. And that's the only thing that upset him, that I'd got that wrong. And he's like, how did you forget that, babe? And I'm like, of course, you have like potato salad, not potato dumplings. Sorry, Martin. And then he's like, that's fine. And then, he, then the next line was, <laughs> I am crying all the time. This book this dot 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 and then he said and laughing but mostly crying and he just like said yeah it's yours it's, it's been great let's do another sequel let's do a sequel <laughs> <laughs> like, no man just we need to we need to rest <laughs> seems, actually while you're recounting that i started getting this from some like I could see as you were talking, I'm like, but this is how the book goes. Like, I feel like there's all these little elements. Um, and I think that's the beauty of being open uh, to anything coming your way. And sometimes I think if you work as a, a pants or a guest or that you let your intuition guide you, um, that you're, you let um, happenstance happen to you. That's a silly word thing. But yeah, you <laughs> let things happen to you and then you can decide how that might shape your story because it seems like I started off wanting to do this but then I started slowly, slowly little bits of the story start to come and then you, because um, there are twins, um, the sisters, and I don't want to give too much away because you have to kind of read it yourself. Um, but there's, I'm like, yes, that happens in it and then there's all these other things and I just, um, and I just wondered like, uh, particularly when you start off with the raw idea and then at like a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months in into it, is that when you start saying, okay, I think the novel might be about this, but I still don't quite know what else have I got to learn about it? Like if you want to kind of, at what stage do you start realising, okay, I, I think I know what this is? Yeah, absolutely. It um, It's only when I have a lot of scenes that I start to even try and think of a story arc or if it's what's missing in the story. Mm -hmm. So I might think what's missing if, if these two scenes go together, then what, what's missing here? What do I need to add? When I've got a lot of scenes, maybe three quarters of a bulk, yep. I try and start to think about structure yeah. that would work. <laughs> and it's in this is where things get really crazy. So I, I, write, I, I try and sort of map out what scenes would go together. I call scenes like what they're called, he stands by the telephone, my grandma cries, the tennis, um, the truth, or the, I call them sort of, it's an organic, they all have titles. And by this time I've drafted every scene about oh, this book between 10 and 20 times so that they are like the best I can get them before they're even ready to go down Mm -hmm. with any other scene um so I get these boards and I try and work out they, they're quite 
they're quite insane. I try and work out what scenes go where. Um, and I put... Yes. Anything that works is different for every book. Anything that works, don't let anyone tell you that it's wrong. If it works for you, it's, it, it, if it, it can be as odd as mm -hmm. you can imagine. And, but if it works, it works. There's no one way, especially with structure, because if you think about the million possibilities structure has, you could start from the middle and, and go backwards and then forwards. You could be first person, third person. You could have six different voices telling the story. You could, it's pretty crazy how many options you've got with structure. It's, it's the hard bit and it's the bit that I nearly give up and I decide the book can't work. It's impossible. It doesn't go together. It's not even about anything. Like, what was I thinking? Mm. Like, um, I've got note, my note, I keep a daily notebook of where I'm at and there's just days of going, this is rubbish, I can't find any way, I don't know what I'm doing, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's a, so it's about trial and error and this is the hardest bit and trying different things and then you might get like a corner together of the story. You go, okay, I think these three scenes go together and they sort of, that works. They've got the, the themes uh, match and it, the story makes sense um, with these three together. So then what would come next? It's just like a puzzle. And of course then you have to change a lot of things with continuity because you're moving scenes around. So that might not make yeah. sense anymore. You have to edit again, another draft, another draft, another draft. Um, but eventually it starts to come clear and this is the point in time when I think it's the structure sort of holding and working that then I give it to one reader that I really trust who can look at it from the outside above and think about the structure in a different brain, not mine. And often then that person or another person that um, is good with structure can tell you, I think if you just move this here it would make more sense or... I think we need to hear from the young girl again yeah. here because there's a big gap. That's gold. And then then from then you're like, oh, thank you, I can see it now. It's easy now, but it, I mean it isn't, so you have to add a lot more, but at least you've got some sort of map. It, it sounds very much like, because uh, you know, sometimes writers will say, because you, you do need to share your work at, at some stage with somebody, um, and, you know, sometimes those early readers, uh, maybe it isn't advisable to give to a family member or a friend because they go, oh, that's great. And I don't think that's what you need to hear <laughs> at the time. No. Because I think it's uh, what you need is someone to support you, but also will say, this isn't quite right. This doesn't this feel isn't right. Working. This isn't working. And because you're so far into something, you can't actually see what you've got. And so having someone and whether it's going to be, if you're, like enough like say well who's going to lie like on to book three now so an editor or, or someone that you trust that has that critical eye because then what they see um makes you question because then you can start divorcing yourself it seems yeah um to then actually make really hard decisions yes. about this is what the book is um and we can come back to that in a second but this is what the book is so therefore this no no longer serves the narrative and you just have to get rid of the stuff because I think what it sounds like to you what the book really is is an emotional connection and that's the heart of the novel and then everything else that happens has to serve that one goal that you've got which is this yeah you you'll write a lot more three four times more than ends up in the story if you write like me I think some people don't do that but mm. I, I write a lot more that you will lose a lot of scenes and they're good scenes there's nothing they might be your best writing in the book but they don't they're not needed yeah. In the end, you've got to get it down to the essence of the story without too much filler. When you do that, do you still keep the fallback? Yes, I keep everything. I keep every single draft. So if I've got 15 drafts of a scene, they're all there still. I especially keep the first draft, which is the raw energy, because if you end up editing too much of that out, you've always got that to go back to to get the, the, the feeling. Um I would say, apart from your trusted writing group, that I um, I don't show anyone my work too early except for my writing group because it's 
too raw and sensitive and it can be damaged or you can be disheartened or you can people might say oh this isn't very good and then you might give up Mm. but then there comes a point where you do need a reader you'll know when that is right and yes family they're useless (laughs) because they just will say yeah it's great that's not helpful at all it's nice to hear but you need someone to say I think it was really good but this bit didn't make sense I needed more here this was working really well so um because otherwise it's not helpful so that you need that and your writing group will probably give you that if um or uh, you could get a mentorship yeah, yeah. there's lots of things I was lucky enough to get a mentorship with past the shallows and it's the editor now that I use for all my books she's my first reader she's got nothing to do with my publishers she's just there for me so I trust her absolutely um and that was just because I entered that Australian Society of Authors mentorship that I just got her by chance. Such a lucky thing. Um, Those people that are good with um, structure. Mm. Yeah. So with that, um, look, we could go back to the uh, ideas of beginning. I wondered if, um, if, you know, when you end a project, because I think the beautiful thing about uh, creativity is that once you're in it and you're doing it, um, it just keeps coming and, and there's always new projects. And I think sometimes it's important to remind yourself that, oh, this is not the be all and end all of everything I have. Like all new things will come. And I think, um, and certainly true in my experience, when you're writing one book, sometimes there'll be like a theme or an idea. You go, oh, what is this? It doesn't belong here, but it comes, things come from that. And I wonder if, if you can look back, this might be a lot, but if you looked back, um, at say the very beginning with past the showers or even whatever you were writing before that, can you see the germ or the genesis of each subsequent project that comes out of one after the other? Or that's not how you... No, how it's you funny. I didn't think I'd be able to write anything again after past the shallows. Um, and that was leaving that, finishing that writing of that novel, Mm. like before the editing and before the publication, um, I went into real grief because I, that book took me five years and I'd been with the characters for that long. And um, the last scene I wrote um, is in the middle of the book and it's the last time we hear from the youngest boy, Harry. And I was hysterical writing that scene. And afterwards I knew that they wouldn't, they were gone. They were gone. They wouldn't be with me anymore. It, 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 it that disappeared. They weren't going to talk to me anymore. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't go back into my writing room um, for about a month. And I and I thought that's it. I I'm, I'm empty. I've got nothing. I don't want to write anything else. That that I, I just want past the cellos. And I'm I can never imagine. And then you tour the book, and then I find the creative doors closed because you're out in the public world um but yeah as soon as I had space Mm. to go back into the writing room again and just let myself write short stories or write small pieces yeah then I had the next novel and then that's just as obsessive yeah and then that one I went to Antarctica and I did crazy research and it was like all and Denmark and interviewed all these sailors and I thought I'll never have another book. This is just like the, you know, <laughs> 100% of my whole being was this ship and this yeah. book. And then again, the tour, the blah, blah, blah. And then the Jar of Gherkins and here we are. Another year, you know, sometimes too, I, you don't want to go back down into the hole of, of the obsessive writing, not seeing people becoming a recluse. It's nice to be out in the world and be yeah. normal um, because to go back in again, I, I don't want to go back in for a while into just me and my writing because now my writing studio is in the garden. So I don't ever leave the, the house. Like it's really weird. I become very strange, reclusive person when I'm writing. You also seem like you're someone who your characters are so important to you that they almost – 
I mean, I'm obviously, it just seems to me, obviously, they're very real people to you. <laughs> Absolutely. They literally move into part of your body. They move into your house with you. And, um, and you know, the way that you're describing the end of these two boys, like um, the grief for you was very real. And I wondered how important it is uh, for you to have those co- connections with your characters because I guess one part of this question is what are those people doing for you in the book creatively, but also um, because not every writer, again, becomes so attached to their characters or even like a, a place, if you know, lots of people like to write about a particular place. And you said uh, um, your book here um, that you used as research for Pastor Shallows because you couldn't physically go back to this place. I just wondered, it all seemed interconnected for me when you were talking about it. And I just wondered, is that because... Um, Maybe we go there and we can come back to the idea of what it actually means to return to a place that you're writing about what and return to the past. Um, with the characters, um, yeah, of course you don't have to be completely um, as nuts as me and, and that they're very real. But what that does give you um, is intense feeling so that um, the emotional truth in your writing is, is very real if, if if the writer doesn't feel it, I don't think the reader does or will. And I think the reader has to feel it times ten for the reader to feel it in mm-hmm. a normal way. So it's intense. It's um, fear, sadness, joy. With this one, Ludic, the young boy in Prague, a lot of that was a joy to write. Um there comes a time in the writing process where I am three quarters in the book and that's when you lock yourself out of the house. I've got keys hidden everywhere. (laughs) It's when you do, you know, you're looking for your glasses and you're wearing them. Um, But also your loved ones feel your absence because you're not really there. Like I can be having a conversation with my husband and he'll be like, you're in the book, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm at that point where my unconscious is working on it 100% of the time. So it takes over. So it is a relief sometimes to have it. It's gone now yeah. and I can talk about it and I'm back to me and I can go surfing and have conversations with people and be present completely. Um, but I think you have to be – why would you see it through – if it wasn't this, like, passion, yeah. like, why would you put yourself in a room on your own and with all oh, these drafts and feeling awful and feeling like it's not very good and you're not doing a very good job day after day after day, why would you do that if it wasn't this passion, like, to, to drive, I don't know, that <laughs> obsessive thing? Yeah. Oh, there's something that you said and I'm like, oh, I wonder if I should ask about that. I think it's... um. Yeah. The being in a book, I, that kind of uh, when you're not really here and you belong to the book, would you say that is probably something? Because to say to someone that's what it takes to write something and therefore you should embrace actually not being a, a, a whole human <laughs> to everyone in your life. But do you think, I don't know, I kind of I kind of feel like listening to people when they talk about this, that, that actually sounds like a pretty good trade-off, maybe. Um, to because I know this is your work, and this is how you. Uh, it sounds like this is how you filter the world through you, and that you make sense of it. Yeah. And so I just wondered if if that is as horrible as it sounds. It, no, that's it, actually worth it. It's not always horrible. It's just um, intense. Mm. So um, and it can take you away from. Um, some great things. You, know, you, you say no to a lot of things because you want to be with the work or you have to be with the work or you've decided that you're going to make it the priority. Yeah. The work is the priority. I would say the thing that I've learned about writing is there's no one way. And I remember early on, Pastor Shallows hadn't been published and I was in this manuscript development program which was another great thing, but it was also really scary. We had these sort of um, authors come to talk to us and what they were saying is there really is one way to write a book and you plan it out and you start from the start and you continue. 
with the plan and I sat there thinking, oh, I, I don't think that I'm a writer then. Like I, I don't think that this book's going to be any good because I haven't done it like that and I didn't do it like that and I can't imagine being able to work that way. Um, but I didn't say anything. I was really um, shy and it was a um, intimidating sort of situation. Mm. Years later, of course, I realised writers have all different ways to work. I've met as many writers that write like me as I have people that sort of plan out and, and work like that. There's no right way. Don't let anyone tell you that your way isn't right. What we all share is doing the work. I think there's this sort of um, idea that writers swan around and go to cafes and, you know, write a few paragraphs and it's all wonderful but it's not, it's actually a lot of hard work and feeling pretty um, not confident the whole time mm. as well. So feeling like, I'm not sure if this is any good. Some days you might have a bit like, maybe this is okay. But there's never, it's never like, wow, I've just written a great scene and I'm feeling fantastic and um, <laughs> life's brilliant. Um, <laughs> it, um, it's just slog and it's, it's, mundane that's mundane going into a room by yourself and sitting at the computer and trying to make a scene and um that's the only thing we share though the work and then I draft heavily this one I draft drafted more than ever so once the raw writing's done then the real work begins which is even harder than writing it's like the the drafting, the raking out of any words that are not meant to be there the shaping of a scene that every scene has an arc, I think, like a whole story. And so working that out, the rhythm, everything, that can go on. One scene can go on for months for me. And, you know, my notes, I can be up to like draft 22 or something that's still not there. That's a, that's a lot. That's the hard work, drafting. Yeah. I, do you, with this book, did you get to the point where you thought, I hate this. <laughs> yeah. I want it. I want to stop. Um, I I definitely was ready to stop, and I had drafted a lot. And as a result, the editing process through the publishers wasn't as arduous as it was with my first two. It still there was a lot, but it was fairly clean because I'd probably worked over the top on it. Um, because there's a lot happens once you give it to the publishers. It's an, like another year of work almost. Yeah. It's, um, lots of edits and um, opinions. I was say, just if we go on that, because I do – can I ask you this? Because I, I do know that it was touch and go for Fable whether this book actually would get published with Hachette, who publishes Fable. And I wondered if you might want to talk a little bit about that because – it's a very scary thing, I think, to have worked on something and you're a professional writer, you've produced this literal labour of love and then for your publisher who is a friend, who you work with, you have this relationship for them to say, I don't know if I like it. Um, that's, I would imagine, a very scary, heartbreaking thing to hear and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how you kind of got through it and then what happened because obviously here it is and it is with them so I just what is that like and then what happens in those couple of weeks to months where it's touch and go and like you know because we can also then maybe we can start talking about uh, the importance of developing our voice and believing in what we're writing about and then not comparing ourselves to other writers because I think we all do that so if you just want to talk about that what that was like for you? Um, yeah, it was a pretty awful time. Um, it was looking like it wasn't going to be published, one, because it wasn't a Fable Parrot novel, meaning that they thought it, it didn't have – it's not set in Tasmania like my first two novels. It doesn't have water in it. A lot of my my two novel, first novels are very water-orientated. And it, it, it's a, maybe a softer or more gentle <coughs> story. Um and, I, and then so I was like, okay, it's not going to get published, that's fine. But I felt devastated, really. And also at that point I thought, I think I'm done. Like, I don't think I want to do this again. No more writing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've said that a couple of times. <laughs> you all will too. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
And my husband was like, great, now you can be a normal person. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But then I I sent it back to this editor that I trust and she said, no favourites, it's it's great. It's, um, but I'm scared for you because it's, I can feel the vulnerability Mm. of this book and I want it to be treated with respect. Then the CEO of Ashet read it and so she's never rung me before. She has said well done for my first two books but I got this call and she's like, favor your book. And she went crazy and, I mean, she's the big boss, you know. So then suddenly it was on and not just on but on with a big budget and on with a great cover and on with her just going, Fable, we're going to sell the shit out of this book and it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And um, it's the biggest tour that I've ever had to do that I'm just about to start. I mean like six weeks away around the country. Um, So really I should have just like gone nuts with it. (laughs) So it went from despair for a month and just like I'm going to give up to like oh it's on and it's great yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. Didn't like it in the first place, right? My published she liked it but she didn't think it would sell and she didn't think it was. So she's your normal person that you get. And she's on board now. She's a very very lovely person. She is very protective too. So I think she was worried. There were lots of reasons. Publishers are a commercial business. Sometimes when you get rejected, it's not because your writing's not brilliant. Mm. It can be my first novel. It got um, was rejected a lot of times from different publishers. With their shit, it took them a year to decide, and this is what it came down to: marketing saying how much can we afford to lose on an Australian literary fiction novel because they don't sell, and the answer was, well, we can afford to lose 15, whatever it is. And they said, okay, we'll go for it. But it was that close. It was like 50-50, could have gone either way. Not because it's not a good novel, not because it's not great, good writing. It is a business. So please remember that too because the other – then the other thing is they get so many manuscripts and it could just be there's two books set in Prague at the same time and – they're like, well, we can't do them both. It's You never know what it is. Yeah. Um, you've just got to keep putting your stuff out there. Um, I used to really push myself to put out short stories for competitions yeah. and um, this is way before I was published as a novelist. And, you know, rejection, rejection, it was years of rejection and then finally you might get one long-listed or that gives you a bit of confidence and then I eventually got one published with Island Magazine and that was amazing like just then you feel like I can send more out I can write more maybe this is a yes from the universe (laughs) yes that my writing's okay but it takes years and a lot of people give up before that point and they might have been much better writers than 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 me and Sarah but they've they, they gave up because they got a couple of rejections and they were like, well, I'm no good or it's too hard. But it's actually years of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the best advice I got from a writing teacher was um, if you knew that the novel you're working on and have spent years on never is never going to be published – would you still finish it? That's a hard question, but inside me it was like, yes, actually now I have to see it through. And I think that's the only answer because if the answer's no, you maybe, you it, yeah. It, and that's maybe. a hard thing. Imagine you've done all that work and it's never going to be published. But I think that's how every first novel is yeah. written. It's not – in your mind it's impossible to get published, but you still do it anyway. You still do this – crazy amount of work in between jobs and family and whatever else study or whatever it is um and that's something pretty amazing that faith yeah it's really important i think faith is a really good way of of talking about it but also uh accepting in some ways because actually 
creation is like this as well, that at some stage you're going to fail um, and it's not even, uh, it might not even be a rejection from a publisher that that's considered a failure. It could be that your book's published and it's seen as a commercial failure, like it didn't sell, it, didn't, mm. it doesn't mean it wasn't bad. But I, I think uh, the other thing about failure is that you're going to try and write something this um and you're going to take chances on like developing your skills like this is a different book for you um and all that kind of stuff and i think uh part of writing is also accepting that you're going to fail um and it could just be oh this thing didn't really work or whatever and i think um does (laughs) this might be a good question knowing that you're going to fail does that actually help you to write in some ways to push um, forward. Yeah, I think it probably frees you up a bit knowing that, like, for example, that nothing is going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Firstly, like, you know, that whole um, idea about, you know, the crappy first draft yeah. that everyone, even the most famous writer, writes a crappy first draft. But without that draft, you have nothing. You can't move on to a second draft. So you, you have to just sit down and do that draft. Yeah. And a lot of people can't even do that because it's too terrifying because it's not perfect. So you've got to let go of perfection. I I wrote this, the raw version of all these scenes with no punctuation, just dashes so and re- repetition. So it's like 3,000 words will turn into 1,000 because I've repeated myself so much. But that's how it worked. That's how I got the first draft down. And... um. Then it was annoying to put all the commas and full stops <laughs> and everything. In. Um, but yeah, you'll find your own way and what's working, just go with it. And um, first draft is about sitting there and yeah. doing it. And then the other draft is about sitting there and crafting it. Um, but also take a notebook with you at all times because those moments of inspiration like the gherkin thing really do happen and they will happen to you especially when you're already in a project you'll find that information's coming at you all the time that seems to be totally about your project um and that's a lovely thing yeah Yeah. because i think it's one of those things where yeah it's like when you you're pregnant or you want to be pregnant and then all of a sudden there are babies everywhere and there are pregnant women everywhere and so uh, when you're working on something um yeah you start because you're thinking like that and uh you're like writers are such magpies all the time just picking up things and um, I don't know if magpies do that. Is that birds? Who knows? A bird. Uh, that, you know, you're kind of constantly, everything that you see is so relevant to you. You might as well just write it all down and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I yeah. think the one thing I want to keep asking you is uh, writer's voice and the stories that we choose to tell. We've spoken about this, how we feel we're completely irrelevant in comparison to, you know, a lot of the great literature that's been produced in Australia and all that stuff. And I think maybe we could talk about that and doubt because um, we almost can go, um, we've got 10 minutes to go. We've got so many things to ask you, but we ask you questions. But I think it's one of those things, um, if you just want to talk about, like, um, accepting that it's interesting. This book was told that it's not a fable parrot book. But it clearly is because she wrote it. (laughs) And I think, uh, and I just, so what that suggests to me is that, you know, you're forever wanting to develop your voice or even just there are things that you want to explore. Um, Where am I going with this question? More that what are you accepting about yourself and your voice and what are you trying to develop and and how you see this book as it really is a fable parrot book because it, it comes back to all these things. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've learned or that I know now is um, we all have unique voices and that's um, a great thing. No one writes like you, the way you do, the way Sarah does, the way any of you write, the way I write. Um, that belongs to us and it's something to be proud of. However, we sort of have to work at our voice mm. as well and that comes with the daily writing or the however often you do it the sitting there and writing the working at it the getting through it um and crafting it but yeah this is my this book is my voice but it's um it's probably um because I drafted so much every word is 
in in its place, like rhythm wise. I mean, I, I almost know this book off by heart. So when the if the publishers changed things without my permission, I know straight away if there's a comma in there that shouldn't be there. <laughs> like it's a it. it's it's quite <laughs> freakish. Yeah, like I'm like I know every rhythm of every page of this book because I work so obsessively. Um, so I um I got the voice like. It's like the essence of Fable Parrot voice or something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, what was the other bit of the voice? Oh, confidence. I don't know. I think you just got to trust your work and not compare yourself to other people, which is really hard. It's Even when you're published, it's really hard to go, oh, well, this writer sold 100,000 books and I only sold 5,000 and it, does that mean I'm really terrible and... Um, there's so much comparison of this person got a grant or this person won the awards or this person can write a book a year and it takes me like four years or whatever and I'm so slow and they're so short and I wish I could write a thick book and um, it feels like my book should be this thick because I worked hard um, but you've got to let it go because you no one can write like you that's mm. um, true and you're unique and some people will hate your writing and they'll tell you <laughs> and other people will love it and they'll tell you and um, you'll get good reviews and you'll get bad reviews and all of that stuff is completely out of your control. So try and focus on what you can control, which is your work, doing the work, mm. making it a priority and saying it's important. Even if you say it to yourself, if you t I'm a writer, my work's important, doesn't matter if you're published or not. I'm a writer. My work is important. I'm going to make it a priority. I'm going to give it some time. That's the only way I'm going to get anything out there. Yeah. Um, it still feels really uncomfortable to say I'm a writer. Can you say, like, I, I still feel like I'm a fraud, like someone's going to say, no, you're not. I, I was a, I came to writing late. I was a postman for a long time. I haven't got a degree Um. So I finished high school, worked terrible jobs for a long time, ended up being a postman, which was a job I really liked. Great people walking around outside, minimum wage, which isn't great, but I still had some freedom. You could accrue time off. Um, but my brother had become a sculptor and he was getting some success. He'd really put himself on the line. He'd really mm. put himself out there. That's really brave. And I was so proud of him, but he, he just kept bugging me. And he's like, you used to write when you were a teenager. You wanted to be a writer. What are you going to do about it? He's like, shut up, nothing. Because <laughs> in your head you're going, it's too hard. I'll fail. I can't do it. I, who am I? I'm a high school graduate. Like, I'm a D English student I was as well. So <sighs> he just kept bugging me and I eventually looked into some courses and I went to CAE TAFE in the city and started professional writing and editing and work part-time. And I never finished that course either, so I'm still a high school graduate. Um, <laughs> but I did start writing Past the Shallows there. I had a great one fantastic teacher that um, you only need one. It's true. And um, she just said, make this a priority, give it time, forget the doing the bits of the course that you don't want to do, like editing and business planning. And, uh. So I got a studio with some friends and that was my way of saying, this is important, I'm a professional. I've got a workspace that isn't home, so I don't have to do the dishes and worry and procrastinate at home and I just I can come into work and work. Um, that was a big step in taking it seriously then deciding, okay, I'm going to work part-time and then the rest of the time I'm going to work on the right, on the book and I'm going to be poor but it's going to be, I need to do it. So taking yourself seriously even when there's no hope of being published. So yeah, five years later I did manage to get it published and then you still have no money. You don't get paid a lot as a writer. It's a very hard thing to balance. I then got a second book grant which was amazing but many times I've almost had to go back to the postman job mm. or work in a um, 
down in Torquay, they've offered me some work at Torquay Books, but I don't want to give up time. So I'm just juggling at the moment and we'll see how this one goes. I think writing um, and when you choose a creative part in life, it uh, I don't use the word, I don't mean to make a lot of this, but it is a sacrifice. Like I think you, especially if you want to make it your career, and I think uh, I don't want to bring up Elizabeth Gilbert, but I'm going to. She talks about uh, how um, you can have like a job or you have a career or then the vocation. And she's what she's trying to say is like, if you make writing, for example, your job, it becomes hard. It becomes like everything else. But if you start seeing like, no, this is my calling. This is what I'm going to do. That's the thing that kind of keeps you going. And then you don't have to rely on it to make money for you. You don't have to, like, it's this thing that you want to do. And that kind of keeps compelling you. And then you can remind yourself, I am a writer. And then the way I'm going to keep the roof over my head is just have a job. And I don't, and then like, I don't need to make that my career or anything like that. So I guess, I mean, it depends on how you want to live, but I think it's one of those things where you weigh up and like, what are, when I'm on my deathbed, this sounds like, like, what am I going to say to myself that I've done? Um, And it's not, oh, I don't sound like just like, if you never do it, therefore you're a bad person, but you could say, oh, I could have gone and had, uh, I don't know, worked super hard um, with this particular kind of job and had money coming in all the time and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but then I didn't write my novel. Um, all I'm trying to say is... Because yeah, a lot yeah, of times... Yeah, the sacrifice is yeah, definitely worth it. Yeah, sacrifice, but yeah. Um, and, you know, money, it, you need it to live, yes. but um, you don't need a lot. If you have creative time, that's worth a lot. So, yeah, it's so a balance. Guess it's another way of saying too because a lot of people go, I don't have time to write. It's like you could find, if you wanted to, you could find that time, like even if it's half an hour or even whatever. sometimes five minutes. You yeah. go in writing group, think about like an exercise where someone just goes, okay, we're going to write the shoes, go, everybody, five minutes. You can get like a, a, a bit of gold there sometimes when you just throw yourself in five minutes. That's nothing. Yeah. So we forget about that. We think we need like, oh, I need a whole day. I can't do that. Yeah. You just need literally some time. And sometimes it's just thinking time. I do a lot of thinking. and it's But you're processing all the stuff and but then you, you come know, down to do it's, it. But it's you know this. Half of writing is thinking and it's not – that's not wasted time. Everybody used to tell me when I was a kid, you're such a daydreamer, you know, oh. that will never be useful. My God, it's so useful for what <laughs> I ended up doing. Like I'm like, wow, my day, like my imagination is really strong. I can daydream completely a whole world. So I, I'm like, yes, you were wrong. <laughs> this is what you were <laughs> should... literally put here to do, quite possibly. <laughs> Does anyone have, have questions any questions? Now? Um, don't worry if you don't. But I'm just uh, to do dedicate your first book to your brother. I, um, no, actually, my first, <laughs> my second book to my brother, my oh, no. first one to a really good friend who was the first person to ever say to me, you know, when you say to people, I'm writing a book, and they're like, oh, like, yeah. they're like thinking, you'll never get that published, yeah. oh, that's weird. She was like, that's great. I think it's going to be excellent. I was like, really? Um, <laughs> and she helped me a lot with yeah, confidence. Cool, yeah, like, and I was surprised. Like, oh, my God, someone thinks it's, it's not a crazy idea. idea. No. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you need those people in your corner. Mm-hmm. Hold on to those people. Everyone, need, I feel like you need a, a belief patron, just one person yeah. that just keeps yeah. on pushing you through. They yeah. might not have money to give you. That would be nice. <laughs> they, they You're a real, nice a real patron, old school patron. <laughs> um, do you read other novels? Oh, and does that, how does that influence you? Yeah, I read a lot. So um, I read a, a book a week. But then there's times in the book process, the writing process, where you, my brain won't let me read or I'm reading weird things like um, books about uh, polar vessels, you know, so non-fiction or I'm reading books about communist Prague or, but I read a lot of fiction, mm. um, especially in the early um, process and all the time, like now, mm. in my downtime, reading's like key to everything yeah, in my yeah. life. I love it. But yeah, um, yeah. And, and do you sort of start finding yourself analysing those books? 
Yeah, one what thing. Your life <laughs> and what you yeah, one thing that changes, and you'll know this, the writers here. Um, remember when reading was just you just read and it was a story and it was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. M- maybe even more than entertainment as well. It was it was a whole world and it changed you. But you just yeah, you weren't analysing it now. I'll read a paragraph and I have to stop and either oh. take notes frantically mm. about what I'm working on or I'm like, what's happening here in this paragraph? This is amazing. And I, and so the reading becomes very different. You've lost that like childhood sort of like, wow, tell me a story and you're carried away it's with true. it. It's yeah. True. Now it's more like, um, yeah, oh, this is firing off a lot of ideas here. Yeah. Yeah. It's becoming a Especially when you get into a book that you didn't expect and that you want to keep reading. And I'm thinking, why do I want to keep reading? What is the author? How has he written that? Yeah, what, way how that is I the pace? Yeah, I know. Why, it's... why is this book different to something else I've read? What? And then I start thinking, what have they done? What have... But it's good. It is good because then you become a critical reader. And um, yeah. so you are. As a writer, you need to be that. I would, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. How do you quarantine if you're, because I do the same thing. I like reading, but how do you quarantine the creative mind from the mind that is immersed in the story and and avoid picking up that writer's I, voice? I I think it's um you can definitely be influenced by people, and I've heard this rule from some writing teachers that, you know, you should never read more than two books in a row by the same author because you might start sort of emulating mm-hmm. them or copying. I'm not sure about that. I I think while you're writing, your brain will um, lead you to the books you need to be reading mm-hmm. and that, and for some reason I, I believe mm-hmm. that totally. Mm-hmm. You know how you can have a pile of books that have been sitting there for a year and suddenly you're like, oh, I've got to read this one now, right now, and then you'll realise why. you go, oh, this just solved this problem I was having with voice or, mm-hmm. oh, oh, this all right is doing this, this is amazing. Um, so just read whatever, I say read whatever you want at any time, whatever's yelling at you. Yeah. Could you show us more? Of course, sorry. Um, I should Amazing. pass things around. Um, with my first novel, Past the Shallows, I didn't want to go back to the town that I grew up in because I wanted to work from memory. Also, I'm a little bit terrified of this place. <laughs> um, so I kept a photo uh, sort of journal thing um, inspiration book, I would say, and I um I I started every day by listening to music and and looking at this book, um, and I added to it, and I had other things on the table, abalone shells, and um, yeah, so it's pretty old school. Now I just have a slideshow on my computer, um, rather than cut and paste. But there is something nice about cut and paste. Mm. Oh, actually, this new book, I did cut and paste, but I stuck things on my wall. So black and white photos of Prague. Then a year into the novel, I started colouring the black and white photos oh, in with more. fluorescent, like, pencils. So, <laughs> which was very <laughs> weird and I didn't know why I was doing it. But well, if you read my book, it, it, it will make sense. It, it, it was a key moment. I was like, ah. Oh. But my husband did come in and firstly he said, why have you super glued stuff onto the wall? And, <laughs> which is none of his business because it's my it's my garden shared workshop. But also, and then what are you doing with the colouring pencils? <laughs> I was like, Fable it's very important. <laughs> He's like, well, you're working really hard in here, Fable. I'm like, <laughs> colouring in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one way. There's no right ways. Um, yeah. I also keep a I keep a daily um, notebook of where I'm at. So I've got this feeling like when I leave the room at the end of my working day, I want all of the threads and feeling to stay in the room. Like I want to be able to walk back into that in the morning. 
but your brain forgets things. So I, le I leave a note of what I was working on. So I might say Friday the 15th, 11.30 means when I started. Working on Auntie Eva draft five. And then I'll just write some notes about how it's going and they're usually like going terribly or I'm lost or this is <laughs> hopeless. Um, and I keep these and so that's a really good way. I come straight into the room and go, oh, I was working on that and read that straight away. Because you can lose a lot of time going, I don't know what I was working on and you, you can fragment yourself. Yeah. Um, I found that really helpful for this book. Um, I also used photos... This is a really famous photographer of um, Prague, Communist Prague, um, and it's called the Prague Walker. And they're just photos of everyday life in oh. Prague, and I just, they're mesmerizing. So, on a day when I was completely stuck, I don't know what to work on today, what I'd do is this was my go to, and I'd just choose a photo and make myself do a writing exercise. So, I'd, um, you know, be like these two people in the park go and I just feel it. And a lot of these turned into scenes. Mm -hmm. Old Lady Blazer is from this book. Like ah. lots of things. So, yeah, mm -hmm. use whatever you can. I, I, I watched a two-hour um, documentary about the Spartan Cave, the big thing at the arena. So um, things like that. Yes. Yeah. Just... You'll do research, you'll know what to do, when to do it. Try different things. Walking is really good too at the end of the day. I often walk and take my notebook and things will, because you're moving, yeah. you're finished for the day, but like suddenly you'll be like, ah, oh. and you'll just write a few notes and it will tie things up or tomorrow work on this or walking really helps. Yeah. Is there any yeah. more? We're, we're a little bit over time, but I think we can have a few more questions because then we've got some bickies and stuff <laughs> and books, many books to buy. Anyone else? I think, uh, in terms of the writing life and balancing the, the, the muse and the, the desire to write and also the need to make an income. Yeah. Uh, the way you describe it, you seem to be a discovery writer. So the advantage of that is you're writing stuff. I'm more of a planner, which means I make things out but no words are going down in the real stuff. And so to convince my partner that I'm actually making progress is a lot harder and I'm not making money while I'm doing it. Of course, I understand. How do you balance that, especially with your obligation to more beyond yourself? It's really hard. I would say at the start I just said I, I'm going to give myself this many years or this much time and I'm absolutely going to do that and no one's going to take that away from me. Um, and that's probably an agreement that you, you have to have with your family, talk to them about it. Um, and after that I'll reassess them. But I've managed to extend it. But there's been many <laughs> times like... And I was telling Sarah, this is the most ridiculous story, but I literally was down to like $100 and um, until I get an advance for the next book, you know, there's no money coming in. And I was thinking about things that I could sell rather than going back to work. And um, I have a print on my wall by this graffiti artist called Banksy and it's a screen print and it's numbered. It's like 500 or something out of 600. And I was thinking, oh, I think I bought it for $500. Maybe it's worth 3000 or something. And luckily for me, I looked it up and it's worth $20,000. And so I've put it in for auction. Oh, and that's... It doesn't shred itself. I know, I know. <laughs> don't, don't give me another attack. I mean, Banksy would be mortified that I'm yeah. making money on off his prints. I know, but Banksy, I'm desperate. Not that he's dead, but um, it, like that was just a gift. I was like, that that is enough to live on until I get my next advance. So it gets to the, that point. It's pretty stupid. Mm. However, there are some grants. They're very mm. hard to get, but. It is possible to get one. I got one for the second book and Mark Brandy just got one 
this round with Aus uh, Australia Council. There's local grants, mm. there's prize money for things, but it is difficult. There's teaching workshops, which is um, I'm not very good at, but some people are really good at it. Some writers do that a lot. I've been doing a lot of school talks with Past the Shallows because that's on the um, HSC syllabus. Um, that helps. But yeah, it's like running a small business, but you're not making a lot of money. Yeah. And I think you'll find that too. Like sometimes when you decide to do, like I know I don't write full time, um, and lots of people don't. And when you do and you decide, but I do know a few uh, who do write full time, and so uh, part even they have to structure writing around the things in writing that make them money, which is appearances, freelance work. So you do have to make that balance. And I think for your situation, it would just be, I'm not making money from it and I might not, but I'm still going to write, write it. Um, and then maybe because eventually maybe one day, like it will get picked up and then you might, like you, who knows? I, I mean, think some people, their first novel can sell 100,000 copies yeah. and overseas and they, they're, off they go, yeah. like, and that that is um fantastic. That's amazing. Um, other people might win um some big prizes as well, like um eighty thousand dollar prizes, and that's enough to live on for yeah. a couple of years for me. Um, but you're right. Even the writers that are full time, someone like Maxine Benaber Clark, yeah. she's constantly doing freelance work. She works for the um, Saturday paper. She writes a piece for them every week. And all this other stuff, as well as a novel, as well as touring, as well as her kids' books. And even then it's very hard to get enough money. She does it, but it's almost like working two jobs. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I think sometimes, it's, it's, it's especially for you guys, like to think about it like, yeah, there might be some writers who write full time um, and they legitimately get to. They're literal millionaires. Um, I don't know any millionaires in Australia who write bikes. I'm thinking like JK, right? Like there are people who literally get to write full time and that's all they get to do. Then there are some writers who write full time, but yet actually most of their week is actually working, not on the book, but doing this other stuff to bring the money in. And then there is writers who write part time, work full time and or a combination of the two. It's just, you just got to get the, the money in to do it it's hard there's yeah. no one way of doing this thing it, everybody's just scram juggling yeah like hoping that their next book might keep them going for a bit or you know the advance the first two books i got five thousand dollars advance the the third one i got 50 so that's a, a good year for that's a year for me mm. um <laughs> yeah, but a year, but they take me two years to write, so you've got a year's salary and then you don't have any and oh, just hope that things happen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, do they come with a limit? Like, do they say, here's the grant, but we need it in a year? Oh, yeah, yeah my publishers, I'm, I'm late with everyone ah. and they're pretty good with me, but there's other stories I've heard where they're not so lenient. You have a contract and it says, the delivery date and um, I just ignore it. <laughs> um, they are always say to me too, the, the novel has to be 65,000 words or more and mine never are. There's lots of things that I don't, they no. could sue me I guess if um, <laughs> if they wanted to because technically I have failed the, I haven't delivered on the on contract. The contract. But, you laugh at that but there are, I've heard some stories where people like other publishing houses where if they haven't delivered past a bit, uh, if they've gone over um, over time or they haven't given the book that they were they've delivered a book but it's you know in the process it's changed so much and stuff like they will ask for that money back because that's not what they bought um, the publisher bought a different book and so not to scare but like this can happen but lucky you I mean you've got a pretty good publisher that's so um, they're not as horrible. They're not horrible at all. I no, say. <laughs> I, I, a lot of publishers will wait for you. Nonfiction is different. Yeah. They need it at a time because they've got it locked in for Christmas and they have to have it. Yeah. And um, But, yeah. Yeah. It can be a hard slog. On that note, we But it is possible. It is very possible. <laughs> Listen to Fable. She knows what she's talking about. Um, 
Thank you so much for today's Thank table. you for coming, um, everyone. I could have... Here we keep going. <laughs>